Fuck. And uh, appreciate everybody being here today. I'd like to ask you, if you haven't already done so, to silence your phone so we can carry through the business as well. I'll make sure I do that myself. Uh, thank you for attending. Appreciate your time and, and your service. Uh, we do have a pretty full agenda today, so I'll ask all the people who are speaking to stay within that time frame if possible uh, or to get through. Uh, I'd like to turn, uh, before we call Ro, I'd like to turn to my co-chair and see if she has any comments yes. that she'd like to say. No, <laughs> just thanks, everyone for, thanks, everyone, for being here. I think this is the fullest room we've had since, you know, two years ago. So I love seeing all the faces and hopefully get to around to actually meet everybody in person pretty soon. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. So next item on our agenda, we're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order and... Um, we need a roll call. Senator Wheeler. Present. Representative Lewis. Present. Mr. Abel. Present. Mr. Adkins. Charles Byers. Jacqueline Coleman. Present. Laurie Givens. Here. Carol Henderson. John Hicks. Here. Patsy Jackson. Present. Holly Johnson. Here. Ryan Neff. Mark Overstreet. Here. Katie Shepard. Senator Southworth. Here. And Representative McCool presiding. Here. Thank you. We do have a quorum, so we can go ahead and conduct our business. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the last minutes. Motion. Do Second. We have a motion second. Any questions, comments? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda, we have uh, uh, Dr. Thompson and, and others, I guess, presenting. If you please come forth and introduce yourself. And and we've got you down for 45 minutes, Dr. Thompson. Here we I know that's a restriction, but... but <laughs> <laughs> we, we appreciate your time, so thank you for being thank here today. Thank you, know too well. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and Committee. Aaron Thompson, the President of the Council on Post-Secondary Education. My name is Sean McKernan. I'm Executive Director of Budget and Finance at CPE. Mr. Chair and Committee, we have uh, a lot to go over today. You know, almost all good news. And I want to start the conversation now. We have two of our campuses with us, and we'll have Sean going fairly quickly through the PowerPoint whereby you folk need to really listen to where the rubber meets the road and that's at our campuses. First of all, I want to thank everybody for putting forth the effort this last session to give us about 10% of what we are needing to have, but that was a significant input and we have been able to produce already some good outputs from that and over the next several years even more. As you all know, our campuses have needed this for a long time. I mean, these are state buildings and in many cases, literally falling down around us. So we, first of all, wanna thank you and the legislature for putting forth that effort and the governor for putting it in his budget. So this is, uh, in fact, we hope, to be the first installment of many years to come. I also, before I start this, I just want to give you a quick, fast update on what's going on in higher education. As you know, COVID has slowed down a few things, but one of the things that we have been experiencing over the last several years is a downturn in enrollment uh, for a lot of reasons. One is there are fewer people in high school graduating, but what's a little bit more scary to me, we have about 47.8% of those graduating from high school going on to college. That's somewhat problematic and something I'll bring back to the legislature and the governor's office even more in depth later on with some strategies. But I do quickly want to say, though, in the last several years, we're very proud. We're up about a 17.1% in credentials and degrees uh, uh, obtained, really going toward those high-need areas in Kentucky. More specifically, we're closing some gaps as fast or faster than most states. In that length of time, we had about a 41% increase in our underrepresented minorities. And this is important to us because it really goes to what the capital is needed for, and that's to make sure we are educating the 
future citizens of Kentucky. So I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that this isn't just about buildings. This is truly about building the state's civic power and the long-term, what I would consider, economic value of the state. So we're talking about people. We're talking about students. I just wanted to put that in perspective before we get to the dollars and cents of the buildings and asset preservation. So thank you for letting me have that little interlude with you as an introduction. I'm just going to turn it over to Sean now. As a reminder to this group, um, I guess the best. Uh, in 2005, the council contracted with Vanderbilt Facilities Advisors to conduct a comprehensive study of uh, the facilities on our campuses. This outfit looked at 700 ENG facilities and concluded in 2007 that most of the inventory was in poor, poor condition. Most buildings at the time were over 30 years old. Condition was consistent with, with that advanced age and significant uh, investment was needed to bring HVAC, plumbing, electrical uh, up to, up to uh, industry standards. Uh, many buildings were no longer adequate to support their intended purposes. Uh, evaluators concluded that an investment of $6.1 billion would be needed, uh, projecting that out until 2022. In, in 2000, um, uh, in 2013, they, they concluded, uh, they just, they looked at the cost estimates that they had used and updated them for inflation, and that, uh, that figure grew to $7.3 billion. Excuse me, could, could you pull your mic a little bit closer to you, Certainly. please, if that's okay? Thank you. Uh, during, since uh, 2007, the period since 2007, uh, we've had investment in uh, post-secondary facilities. Uh, the, the state has uh, made uh, $280.7 million in, uh, in state spending for renovation and renewal, and that represented uh, less than 4% of that $7.3 billion need. Uh, however, of course, for, for the current biennium, the General Assembly authorized $700 million for asset preservation projects, a very significant investment. And uh, the, the, the uh, Commonwealth has been following the advice of VFA uh, to, uh, to look at asset preservation uh, with the same kind of uh, determined effort as, as in previous biennia we had looked at uh, new construction. It's always easier to get support for new construction and I think the, uh, the uh, message of the VFA uh, advisors uh, was really taken to heart. So you can see between 2008 and 22-24, and the yellow bars represent uh, asset preservation spending and the, the blue bars represent new and expanded space spending by the state. Over the same period, uh, I would say that the institutions have, have uh, put forth $1.2 billion of their resources uh, to fund asset preservation. So that's very important to keep in mind. In the enacted state budget, the General Assembly authorized $683.5 million for ge in general fund support, uh, bond funds for uh, post-secondary education asset preservation pool. The, the purpose of the pool is to provide funding for individual asset preservation, re renovation, and maintenance projects at our uh, post-secondary campuses. The state budget also appropriated $16.5 million for a standalone asset preservation project at KCTCS. So that brings the, the, uh, the total investment to $700 million, which is what CPE requested for uh, an asset preservation pool. And this slide shows a, uh, the breakdown of that $683.5 million. Uh, it was based on uh, each institution's share of system total category one and category two square feet. That square footage is used in our performance funding model, and that square footage coincides with that square footage that uh, supports student learning. As you may remember, the, uh, the, the match is slightly different than the 50, 50 cents on the dollar that, that CPE had uh, recommended. Uh, recognizing the challenges that the institutions had, had recently faced with uh, with COVID-19 and then also uh, challenges with enrollment. Uh, the, the match for the research institutions was 30 cents per state dollar, and the match at the, at the, at the other universities and at KCTCS 
was 15 cents per state dollar. Now, I just want to take a second and thank you for this because it's important that, and we've had many discussions, I see Budget Director Hicks here, along the lines that we have campuses like Moorhead, KSU, other places really just don't have those dollars to do so while, when I say literally, the building is falling down around us. I, I look at uh, one building at KSU when I was there and still is, the roof was falling in. So that's an important marker, I guess, I just want to bring to the attention and thank you specifically for because, I mean, our campuses, I mean, all would say uh, that they would have liked to have had no match, I'm sure. But compromising at this level, I think, is very helpful, and I just wanted to point out and thank you for that. Just a reminder that the, the match was, uh, sorry, while all, the, all of the universities have the authority to use agency bonds to cover the state match, uh, some are opting at this time, uh, are planning to use other sources of funds, uh, institutional resources, asset preservation fees, uh, in order to, to reduce the borrowing. Uh, KCTCS is authorized to use institutional resources, restricted funds, for their match. And of course, the, uh, the projects, uh, the funding can be used uh, to preserve, renovate, and renew education and general facilities. They can, the funding can also be used uh, because of language included in the budget bill to renew state-owned and operated residential housing facilities, very important to several of our campuses. And uh, just a reminder, the projects that renovate or renew non-ENG athletic facilities, hospitals, or auxiliary enterprises are not eligible to receive funds from the pool. And th this is just a, a glance at, at uh, uh, in, in your materials, there's a, a, a listing of all of the preliminary projects that the institutions are, are planning to, uh, to initiate uh, with the use of these funds, uh, and just a, a real high-level high overview of, of what some of those projects entail at University of Kentucky, building improvements and infrastructure and system improvements, uh, University of Louisville, HVAC, electrical and plumbing, life and safety, uh, ADA improvements, refurbishments, roofs, a very similar list of, of projects like this at each of our campuses. And we do have uh, representatives from the University of Kentucky, Murray State University, and KCTCS that each have a, a small presentation for this, uh, for this body. Mr. Chair, I didn't know if you wanted to ask us questions before they came to the table or wait till they <laughs> testifying. I will say as they do come to the table, no good deed goes unpunished, I guess. Uh, we were very grateful for the money. And then guess what happened? Inflation happened. So I'm sure they're going to talk about, uh, you know, cost overrun from what they originally thought they were going to have to pay based on the amount of inflation that's happened over the last year. So anyway, Mr. Chair, I don't know if you wanted to take questions of Sean while he's at the table. Or? Yes, yes, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson. I do. We have questions from Senator Wheeler. Do you had a comment or question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just, uh, uh, Dr. Thompson, when you reported or stated earlier that uh, you, you found it a troubling statistic that 40, only 47.8 percent of high school graduates were, were going on to college. Does that account for vocational education as well? It does. The only 47.8 percent are going to Kentucky colleges. I should say another 5 percent are going out of state, uh, which I'd rather not to lose any of our talent, as you know, <laughs> Senator. Uh, but no, that accounts. When we think of trade schools in Kentucky, KCTCS, that falls under my line of authority, and that's college. So that's going to uh, any of our trade schools beyond post-secondary. Now, they could be going to a CTC, ATC while they're still in high school. It, it, that doesn't count that, but that's not beyond high school. Do we have any more accurate figure as far as that would encompass folks that uh, maybe are doing apprenticeships or certain other types of things like plumbing and maybe electrical licenses or things like that because – you know, obviously those are very important careers right. that can, you know, frankly pay a lot more than a lot of people with college degrees. I think we've seen with the recent action by the president to forgive all this student debt out there that a lot of these degrees that folks are getting are not 
mm-hmm. necessarily bringing them a lot of remuneration in the real world. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to see, you know, maybe a, a broader encompassing spectrum as far as what, you know, education can mean a lot of different things, sure. it, not just college. And well, yeah, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, sir. no, no. Go ahead, doctor. No, I'm saying for me, that is college. We count that as college, what you're talking about. Okay. So when I say college, I'm talking about if you get a welding certificate or if you're getting that, that to me is college. College doesn't have to be a four-year degree by no stretch of the imagination. If you get a six-month certificate in welding from one of our institutions, I count that as college. And we count that in our educational attainment even because that is as important as getting people out into the workforce as others. So when I say college, I'm going not just four-year degrees. As Representative McCool can tell you, I am very much there saying that we have to holistically look at what's good and you don't need for me to go in this conversation I know but that's why I argue that we need to get our students early to know their sociological psychological attitudinal way of thinking about going and I believe that every one of our students in high school and college should have a work-based learning apprenticeship some level of work-based learning experience before they leave college so I'm I'm there with you because we have to start thinking about holistically how do we get our state to a point of thriving economically? So our numbers do include those, to make a long story short. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. And make a quick comment on that, Dr. Thompson. You know, we, we did a bill that actually helps to follow up on those and the technical skills and jobs. And so I think that, that report is due out probably in spring of next year, our first go. So that, that will help identify uh-huh. some of those areas that may not have been caught uh, so it is college, but it also shows their production and successfulness, too. Absolutely. And we haven't broken down by all of those, by the way. Thank God we have KY Stats in the state, which is best, better than any other, let me just say, give them a plug, better than any other thing in any other state. Uh, we can break down data at levels that are unbelievable and all different kinds of data by the way, as we triangulate it with our, even our health and a variety of other places. So I, I think this really gives, and I think that's where you're going, Senator Wheeler, I think this really gives us an example of how we can futuristically look at what the state needs, no matter where they're at. State needs four-year degrees too, though, by the way. Don't, don't let me forget that. They even need graduate degrees and maybe even more professors as we now look at the data. But the idea that this gives us an opportunity to not just look at what we've done, but what we're going to need 10 years from now, and that gives us an economic advantage, in my opinion, an economic development advantage. Uh, And I think those are the kinds of questions that I would hope that we'd be able to strategically even talk about and think about and even invest in. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I think we've got a question from Central Southworth. Oh, I didn't mean to get totally off track here, but the um, the question we just talked about, just finish a clarification on the 50 total some percent of all of the college attendance and what trades, vocations, whatnot. Are we also doing, or I don't know about the study, if it's including or something you guys have looked at, because I know it starts walking outside of CPE a little bit, but are we looking at other people who have, uh, maybe they had a high school education, but then they have gotten a job and they're very successful, and so they just didn't never really need any of those certifications. I mean, I'm, you know, some people start bagging groceries at Kroger and now they're the executive level, but they don't, you know, that kind of thing. It, are we including that? Because I'd like to somehow get to the bottom of how many people are extremely productive with just their high school diploma versus the number who of the 40-some percent are not sure well we've done and kentucky is the first state to do this too i always like to say we're first and we've done two return on investment reports that track two graduating classes uh from tw- uh, eight years ago and 10 years ago now that looked all the way back at every single one of those people that graduated from high school see where they went the money they made 
what position they're in. We have that those data. Once again, we when we did our return on investment, we didn't do it at the macro level, which you hear the Georgetown study mentioned all the time in D.C. They've done that at a macro level. We decided we we're going to do it at a micro level and look at every single student. So, yes. And we triangulate that also with unemployment data. We triangulate that with uh, people that may still be looking for jobs that we don't know about that's no longer on unemployment rolls. We look at our SNAP data. We look at our uh, other sorts of data and trade. We even look at our criminal justice data and look at all those. So we look to see exactly where students are. Uh, we What we'd love to end up doing, obviously, is even have more of a longitudinal data, but we're just now starting this to look at where they're at 20 years from now versus where they're at in eight years out, what we have currently in, in that. So we have that data down to the level. Once again, CPE folk, uh, I mean, our data people and KY stats there, of course, we're all in this together. So we're able to look at, and that's what I want to do. I do a, I'm do. i a statistician by trade, as you all probably know. Uh, but I do, I do a lot of predictive analytics to figure out exactly what variables do you need to put in in order to get the output you need for the overall workforce that we need to build the economy that we need. Thanks so much. Thank you. I don't see, oh, got a question? Yes. <laughs> That's right. They're one of our their colleges. We call it technical, but yes, you can call it trade. Yeah. I, I think you are, and let me try to answer, and if I'm wrong, I'm sure you'll tell me I am. But, uh, you know, there's, there's three things that needs to be mentioned. You can do some vocational stuff while you're still in high school. We don't – higher education, I don't track that, but K-12 they do, and with KY stats, they're in there. So you can get those data, right? So you can get a trade, if you will, while you're still in high school in one of what we call the traditional vocational schools or ATCs or CTCs. Now, what we figured out in most of those data, I'll give you just a macro look at this, most of those certificates are going to need to be stackable down the road in order to get that next level. That's where KCTCS comes in. It should be able to build off of that AC, ATC or CTC to build where they can have, if they're gonna work at the Ford plant, they're probably gonna need to get an upgraded certificate in that area, TIG or whatever, right? So what we do, though, we look at, we just did a study to look at even uh, certificates that mattered. So not all certificates, I'm going to say this carefully, and we can go down the rabbit hole. I know that's not where you want me to go. But we're, some certificates may not be of as much quality to the overall need or output based on the amount of money that they even borrow. That's why we have the student right to know, Representative McCool, first one in the nation, by the way, just let you know. But uh, the idea that we do track each one of those at the level that they get those to see what the outcomes are. Now, we're even starting to get out-of-state data, out-of-state stuff, which we hadn't been able to do before. The clearinghouse has offered us an opportunity to do that. But yes, we, we do that. Now, what we don't know is, over the long term, in 10 years, where is that person at, how much money they make at that micro level? We haven't gotten to that point yet. We don't have enough data in our database yet to do that. But we do know what they're making five years out, as an example. We do know how much uh, they're doing, whether they're still employed, and so on. So that's why I'm pushing heavily that we create a stackable way of thinking about it where students don't lose their credit, but easily be able to get back into a place to get an upskill that they need. Am I coming close to answering your question? 
Not quite. Okay. Yes, ma'am, they are. They are eligible for student loans. Yeah. Yeah, in, in our trade school, they are colleges, so they're eligible for Title IV. So yeah, I, once again, I don't distinguish, and maybe this is the nomenclature, I don't distinguish our trade school any difference than I would UK or U of L. They offer different things, but KCTCS, each of our 16 colleges, to me is one of my colleges. And so no matter what they offer, they are accredited, uh, and they are eligible for Title IV as much as UK's degrees are. So there's no difference there. So when it comes to the standard by which we judge quality, they are all there in the same place. We can call them whatever you want to, I call them college. And by the way, there is a, there is a mentality, I hate to say, when we talk to kids about, well, this is college too. They don't see it as a second class citizen's route to success. Does that make sense? And hopefully I'm answering. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. We have two more uh, comments or questions from Mr. Hicks and Mr. Atkins, and then we'll move on if that's okay because we need to get the other presenters yeah. in as well. Well, I'm glad that Dr. Thompson called out KY Stats. KY Stats is an organization within the Education and Labor Cabinet, but is guided by an advisory committee that involves the Council on Post Secondary Ed, all of post secondary, <laughs> and many other elements. So we have one of the most advanced databases in the country. Uh, on statewide longitudinal data systems related to education. So if you want to learn more about this, go to KY Stats online and look. The, the amount of work they do is amazing. The General Assembly has been very supportive of that organization, uh, replacing lost federal funds to maintain their capacity. So it's, it's just one of the best elements, and it's known nationwide uh, uh, by, by peers as one of the best. Uh, secondly, one of the things that also happened in this past budget was a number of, uh, of uh, workforce related initiatives, one of which is with the Council on Post-Secondary Education, one of which is with KCTCS. So to think about this more, even more broadly, we're, we're thinking more broadly now as a government in terms of, you know, of the relationship between education and training and work. Uh, so, so there's a lot of good efforts being moved forward and, and, and supported by you know, all elements of the state leadership. And then one question for Sean. You mentioned that uh, institutional funds have been put in at about $1.2 billion uh, toward asset preservation. Over what time period? Between 08 and 22. Okay, thanks. And that doesn't even include uh, some of the, uh, the other sources of funds, uh, guaranteed energy savings projects, um, Third, third party partnerships. So uh, the institutions really have, have done uh, a, a lot of work in keeping up these state assets. Mr. Hicks, have you finished? Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Atkins, got a question, comment? Um, Dr. Thompson, following up on some of the conversation that's already happened, um, you know, I, I'm seeing where we're involved every day, a shift in curriculum, a shift in training, a shift in education. Uh, we see a, an evolving economy of announcements that have been made over the last, especially two and a half to three years, two of the largest announcements made in the state's history when it comes to economic development, and that has happened with teamwork. It has happened with bipartisan support from the administration to the legislature, economic development cabinet. Uh, we have seen uh, an unbelievable attitude shift over the years from the type of education that you're gonna get, whether it's in a profession of four year to masters, doctorals, whatever, to that person taking another track in their, in their curriculum, whether it be at the high school level, and I hope all high schools are doing this now, identifying kids and trying to get them on the right career path. I think it's critical for that. Um, we're seeing a shift in, in really uh, uh, priorities and funding from recommendations from the governor to the legislature and the legislature confirming a lot of those recommendations. Last two budget cycles, over 200 and some million dollars have been approved uh, for career and technical education centers 
at high schools uh, across Kentucky to try to make sure that we have this pipeline of workforce that we that we need so badly, not only today, but in, in, in the future. Um, so, so as you see that shift in attitude, you know, uh, an individual puts on a hard hat and a pair of steel-toed boots and is able to strike a, a, a welding rod and be able to do that performance, to me is the same respect that somebody gets that's going in an operating room or going into a technician room or anything else in the type of work. And I think that's being viewed that way now. I really do. I've seen that shift in attitude of career paths that people take, and we need all career paths. You know, we've got a shortage of nurses of 6,000 in Kentucky. We've got a shortage of trades folks of thousands as well. And now we're having numerous job announcements across Kentucky that is going to be a, really a good challenge for every segment of education, regardless of where elementary, secondary, uh, career technical education, uh, KCTCS, higher ed, the whole deal is going to be really important. So, so a subject that we have worked on for a long time is the subject of being able to transfer credit hours. Mm -hmm. And I know we got four-year institutions sitting in here along with KCTCS, but the challenge continues, I think, and I hope it's improved some, that that individual that did go into career technical education at the high school level or that individual that went into a career path at the high school level into the four-year institution, or somebody that went to KCTCS with the hope of transferring credit hours onto that four-year institution. I think it's even more important today than it's ever been for that pipeline of workforce that we're needing so badly. So I guess I'd like a little bit of update on that because I voted on legislation to help with that process and streamline those credit hours from one place to the other to make sure students can stay on track and to make sure that they're not back, uh, knocked down and said, no, that really didn't count here. you got to retake this class here. Can you give an update on that quickly? I think it's important to this subject. I, I actually think it is. I think it even coincides very much with capital in many ways. A couple of quick statements I'll make before I give you a quick update on this. One is, the, yeah, I, I haven't seen actually us where I've been in higher education for 35 years. I'm a Kentuckian son of an illiterate coal miner. I know the importance of work. I've not seen us work this way together ever. I mean, when I think of the legislature, when I think of the governor's office, when I think of our technical schools, our four-year institutions, and our high schools doing that. So I could talk an hour on this if you'd like for me to, I will. Transfer. In 2010, we passed the transfer bill. I helped shape that and that is working beautifully when it comes to what I call those transfer courses. In other words, if you take what is traditionally called the liberal arts area or the general education area, no problems. Kentucky was the first to do that the way we did, working beautifully so. But we've shifted our ways of thinking a little bit. Even we're not shifted from the standpoint that we don't want this to be steady, what we've done. But we're having a lot more of the technical areas. And so we had to work really hard to get our high schools and our two-year campuses to articulate. Happy to say, I'm looking at Jennifer back here. I think we've done that. So now if you take a course somewhere, it's going to articulate or across all of our 16 community colleges. We just got that in order. So that's one of the things you've heard. What we haven't fully gotten order yet, and don't know fully how to do this yet, just to be straightforward, is that many of our four-year campuses don't offer these technical courses. There's nothing really to transfer to it. So if we wanted to extend a four-year degree in those highly technical fields on our four-year campuses, Moorhead did our first, I think, connection. We're going to have to start building more of what I call those tech-savvy four-year degrees that they can transfer into. So that's what we're working on now. So the hope is that if you start in high school, get some articulated credit to our two-year schools and do that onto our four-year schools. I even like to see us do it for things as teacher education even. I mean, so I think this is a new way of thinking. And just to let you know, Kentucky has been written up a lot here. And we were able to pay a story this morning where we are setting forth some agenda items that no other state's doing in some of these particular areas, especially as we connect 
higher education or education as a whole to the workforce and that to the economy for longer sustainability. So uh, you're absolutely right. I hope I've answered your question. Separate from technical education, I hope those that are going to our community technical college systems that are working on four-year degrees as well, I'm hoping that those transfer credit hours are going more smoothly and more in a streamlined way that as we attended for them to do when we passed the legislation. They are. There's one glitch that we're fixing, hopefully, and that is that if you go into a highly specialized area like nursing, which four-year institutions have, you can move from a RN to a BSN from a two to a four year. There's sometimes courses taken that are a little bit different that aren't articulating exactly in the same way that we need to fix. There, there are sometimes in some of our cases, if you take an English course and it's an honors English course, it may not it may not seamlessly transfer. These are small glitches that we are working on now. These are items that I think that. Uh, until we even had the way of thinking about this, we would not have had the way to fix it. So we are. They're getting better all the time. We do still have glitches, but most of them lie within what I call those very highly accredited specific areas, uh, not in the more generalized areas. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Mr. Atkins. Uh, I guess we'll move on now to the, uh, I think we're finished with the questions for this portion. You got couple other presenters as well yes we do we can bring them forward and have them introduce themselves and and carry on and keep in mind please the the time frame so we have uh angie martin and kevin Locke from university of kentucky please introduce yourself and proceed And I'm Kevin Locke. I am the Associate Vice President for Planning, Design, and Construction at UK. We first want to sincerely thank the General Assembly for the significant investment in our asset preservation, uh, in our asset preservation works. If you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> UK's Lexington campus spans 900 acres with about 11 million square feet in what's called education and general facilities alone. The average age of our, those facilities is more than 56 years. We look forward to continuing our partnership with the state in the future to address more than our $2.4 billion worth of needs on our existing education and general facilities. What you see on this slide is the total asset preservation funding that the university received. Is your microphone on? Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are receiving 154 million from the state, and we are matching that with 46.26 million for a total of a little over 200 million. We conducted a thorough review and an analysis of how best to deploy the asset preservation funds. Using these five principles, we selected six facilities and various infrastructure projects that are going to touch many more facilities. The first uh, principle is simply to preserve and extend the useful life of existing facilities. The second is to improve existing space to serve our growing population. This fall, UK has enrolled its largest first year class of more than 6,000 students. So we are now instructing more than 33,000 students, our largest enrollment in history. Uh, the third principle is to create space for research collaboration. Uh, due to our growth this fall, UK added over 200 new faculty members to advance the university's instruction, research, service, and healthcare missions. 
Our fourth principle is to efficiently manage repair and maintenance costs. And the fifth is to upgrade existing infrastructure to improve energy efficiency and service. So can, with can these- I, Can I step in here right quick, please? We're, we do have a time frame, and I apologize for that. Uh, could you jump into like the summary of, of your presentation so we can Certainly. move on and get the other t uh, presenters time to speak as well? Is that okay? Of course. Thank you. Um, with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Kevin. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, there you go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so this is a listing of the the projects that we we have looked at based on the criteria that uh, Angie was going over. Uh, we have approximately two hundred million dollars over two years for this biennium, and I'll go over three of these projects in a little bit more detail here. I want to kind of put out there that this is our current plan. Uh, there is so much volatility in the construction market right now uh, that there are things that are going to be beyond our control. So uh, as adjustments are needed, we will, we will update this as we move forward. And before I get into um, some of the specifics of the slides, I don't have a slide for infrastructure work here, but I want to emphasize the importance of that. I don't want to show you a slide or picture of open trenches or switch gear panels or anything like that, but that doesn't mean that that's not a very important part of the utilization of this money. So we have several, several projects that we have looked at uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, and if you'll bear with me just a little bit here, we have a variety of ADA issues across the campus that we're going to be addressing with this money. We have electrical distribution projects at M.I. King Library, T.H. Morgan, and Taylor Ed that we're going to be addressing. We have utility distribution, over $10 million slated for work over our campus for steam, uh, chilled water, for duct banks, for sanitary stormwater infrastructure. And we also have building envelope issues that we're going to be addressing with this money at Lafferty Hall. Uh, the Fine Arts Building, Castle Hall, as well as Breckenridge Hall. So that's a very important aspect of this, and I wanted to get that in there because it is uh, such an important aspect of this. One of our projects that I'm extremely excited about is Whitehall Classroom Building, and I don't know if any of you have ever been into that building. It was built in 1969. Over 98% of the first uh, two years of our uh, undergraduates go to classes at Whitehall uh, Classroom Building. It is probably, doesn't have the best reputation on campus. It is dark, uh, it is inflexible. And so what I'm very excited about here is for us to be able to renovate this building so that it is taking 21st century learning environments and inserting it into this building. It's upgrading the HVAC system, the electrical system. It's taking care of some of the natural light that we don't have in the space. So it is truly an inspira inspirational building for us to be able to take this building and, and bring it into the 21st century from a pedagogy standpoint. So uh, we're planning on $83 million for this project. We are in design at this point in time. Uh, we'll be actually selecting a, a design team for this project very soon. So this is, uh, this is something to think about. Another project I wanted to talk about as well uh, 1909 Pence Hall was constructed. Uh, very little uh, improvements have been done. Last major improvement was in 1964. Uh, this is currently the location of our College of Design. They are moving into a new facility, so we're taking this opportunity to renovate this space uh, and also do some of the things that I talked about with flexibility in classrooms and pedagogy. And so we're very excited about this as well. We do have some significant repairs to the exterior masonry, uh, the roofing of this, as well as the HVAC system that we would like to take care of. And the last project I wanted to uh, delve into here is the Multidisciplinary Science Building, MDS. Uh, this project specifically is for the fifth floor. And this is unique because this is gonna be a collaboration. This space is gonna be used by both uh, the College of Health Sciences, as well as the College of Nursing. Uh, they have expansion needs that we need to take care of immediately. Uh, so this is one of those projects where we can renovate that floor, provide the flexible classrooms, the large classroom space, as well as, well as simulation labs 
uh, in this improvement. We're also taking a look at HVAC and electrical upgrades as well. So those are just three of the projects that we're very excited about, and, and we certainly appreciate everything that the, the legislature has done to, to assist Thank with you very us. much for your presentation. do appreciate it. It's, it's, it's very well uh, presented, and certainly appreciate the handout that you, that you provided for us. Uh, does anyone have any questions about asset preservations? Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to see my friend, uh, Dr. Thompson, always. Um, as we are discussing, you know, going through the design process, so I, I believe your first project, it was going to allow more natural light. Um, and, and I assume this, I'm just out of my depth here, but um, as school safety continues to be a concern as we're designing these projects, are, is that being uh, kept in mind as we go through the design process on these projects? Absolutely. Yes, that, that's something that we do, a, a safety assessment of these buildings when we go into the design. So that is part of the design component. Uh, we do want to make sure that these buildings have the appropriate controls that they need uh, from not only, you know, being able to entrance, uh, enter into the building, but uh, security vestibule type arrangements when we, can, when we can do that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you for your time, Dr. Thompson. I think you got two more. Do you? Just um, Murray State, I think. And Thank you for coming forth. You don't mind state your name and for the record, but also if you could kind of keep it as short and brief as you can so we can allow the last presenter for Dr. Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair McCool. My name is Chair Southworth, members of the committee. My name is Jordan Smith. I'm exec the Executive Director of Government and Institutional Relations at Murray State. All right. Click through here. Thank you. Okay, you all have the numbers um, in front of you, and I know President Thompson uh, went through these as well, and, and Sean, but uh, they, the House Bill 1 asset preservation funding for Murray State for the biennium was $47.1 million. Murray State's 15% match using agency bonds is a little over $7 million, which gave us a total of $54.2 million. And again, thank you, General Assembly. This funding was important, is important, and will help us begin to catch up with the stewardship of our collective state assets. So we truly appreciate that. In terms of our top priorities for Murray State, we are uh, 100 years old this year. This is our centennial year. So the first priority is capital renewal and building modernization, taking care of some of our historic buildings, many of which go back to 70, 80, even 100 years old. Also, uh, we wanted to renovate the Oakley Applied Science Building classrooms and enlarge space for the Hudson School of Agriculture, which is located in Oakley currently, and also renovate Mason Hall Labs classrooms and systems for our School of Nursing and Health Professions. The legislature uh, provided Murray State a new School of Nursing building that was in the state budget, um, which was greatly needed. And as you'll see a photo of our current School of Nursing building, but we um, are going to continue to expand nursing. We understand the, the shortage, particularly the shortage of nurses in West Kentucky, and uh, look forward to expanding uh, nursing in both Mason Hall and our new nursing building. I won't go through all of these photos in lieu of time, but just to show you some of our infrastructure projects. This is in Waterfield Library. This is uh, an H our current HVAC system that we will be replacing using this asset preservation funding. Car Hall, this is uh, another HVAC project and um, there will be other maintenance issues that we're going to be working on with this asset preservation funding and Car Hall. Roof issues, uh, like I said, as well as the HVAC. Kerr Center, this is a photo of our student center, um, air handler seals and other items to that building. This is our most visited building on campus. Uh, students come here for campus tours. Students use this facility for meeting spaces. So 
um, a vital building to our campus. CFSB Center also has cooling tower replacements. This is where we hold our uh, basketball games and other really regional events and community events are held here. Racer Arena, the old basketball arena, which Secretary Hicks and Mr. Atkins has spent quite a bit of time in over the years, but this is now, um, we've retrofitted it to be our uh, volleyball court and arena, but also, again, HVAC uh, replacements and all of these historic buildings. Racer Arena is also in um, the very back of Carr Hall, which again dates back to uh, 60, 70 years. ADA access, this is Mason Hall, the current School of Nursing building. Um, we have ADA access issues in all of these historic buildings that we're going to be addressing with this asset preservation funding. Again, generators, elevators, chiller, boilers, all those issues. This is the Oakley Applied Science building where our Hudson School of Agriculture is located. And again, um, ADA issues, HVAC, electrical systems that uh, we look forward to replacing with this asset preservation funding. And lastly, I'll just say um, again, thank you to the legislature. And we are experiencing what I know President Thompson, Sean, uh, University of Kentucky mentioned, we're experiencing um, cost increases since we bid these projects out, delays, labor shortages. So um, the scope of these projects are having to be uh, greatly curtailed but um, this funding is still allowing us to address some much needed issues in these buildings. So with that, Chair McCool, Chair Southworth, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you for your presentation. I don't see any questions at this time, so I appreciate everything and, and we know how valuable it is to get this on the list, so thank, thank you. you. And he came all the way from out west. He did. <laughs> so we have uh, KCTCS. KCTCS. Again, please introduce yourself. Make sure your microphones are on. Pull them close to you. And if you don't mind, uh, a short and summary of it all, if yes, it's okay. Thank I'll you so much. Very quickly. Um, I'm Andy Casebear. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Facilities and Support Services for KCTCS. Good morning. I'm Sandy Atkins. I'm the Director of Capital Projects and Budgeting. Okay. Um, and I'm going to brief and make this as brief as possible. Uh, our situation is that we are um, 16 colleges uh, on 70 campuses. There's about 330 buildings uh, in in multiple locations throughout the state. So our, our situation is where we're not dealing with one campus, but a lot. So we have tried to take this much welcomed and much appreciated, um, she's working on that, but much appreciated uh, money to get the bang for the buck that we needed to get in the majority of our campuses. So we looked at uh, significant issues that we have in a lot of different places. You know, we haven't had much funding of this type to use before, uh, so it was very welcome, and we will use it to the greatest extent possible. Um, okay, sorry, going to the next next slide. So uh, a significant, significant part of what we're trying to do is to address issues that affect uh, not only the building currently and the, the atmosphere for students now, but will give us long-term benefits. So we're doing a lot of roof replacement projects. We're doing a lot of HVAC uh, life safety projects. So ev every campus, uh, most buildings on every campus in our system will be getting upgrades to life safety, so fire alarm systems and things like that. Uh, as far as HVAC, we've concentrated on uh, a number of campuses that have um, opportunities to save us energy consumption in the future, although we've done a lot of ESPC projects and things like that. We are taking this money and putting it to the best use we can so that we not only get the benefit of the money we have now, but we can extend it further. Um, go ahead, I'm gonna just speed up here. Um, so the impact is that we were we are able right now we've identified every project uh, that was in our budget request for uh, the current fiscal year we are going to accomplish every project on that list um, and uh, of course you know we <laughs> uh, that's our plan and then also look at what other 
projects that we had in our six-year plan that are uh, the next in line to go ahead and try to accomplish that as best we can and, and combining some things so that we instead of doing part of an upgrade to a building now and then do another part later if we can do it all together uh, with this because we have this funding we're able to to improve our cost for that specific project so we're doing that so in our in the future our six-year plan is going to change uh, that we will uh, we still are going to have about $310 million worth of deferred maintenance that we would like to accomplish at some point. But by doing the $200 million that we have available here, um, coming off that, those projects can move up, which will also give us the benefit of not just relying on agency restricted funds and donations to make improvements to technology so that we can train the workforce for tomorrow but uh, we're going to be able to uh, maybe get some of those into the six-year plan and do them more logically and, and more planning wise go ahead Cindy. and i'm going as fast as i can <laughs> uh, so i just wanted to highlight three of the projects and i have several photographs from it this is at hopkinsville uh, community college uh, it's one of the most significant, it's the academic building there. We're going to spend about $3.9 million there. It is one of the most important buildings on campus. Uh, every student that goes through uh, Hopkinsville ends up in that building at some point. It's from the 1960s, so its switch gear is dated. Its HVAC systems are dated. The finishes are dated. So we are concentrating on bringing all those systems up to current codes and making life a little bit easier. Um, we're doing a little bit of adjustment of spaces just uh, because we've learned over the years we need different configurations, but not a lot of that. We're trying to focus it on what makes this building get to the next Andy, session. that project may become more important than ever before. Yes, sir. Major announcement that's already been made public. Groundbreaking will be happening soon. It's the first battery supply chain. Yes, sir. Announcement, recycling batteries. Go ahead. Great. We're looking forward to that, actually. Uh, you know, we are working on the Glenville, uh, Glendale battery plant, so the, this is perfect for us. Um, but that building is very important, so we're that, that was the most significant impact we could do to that campus. So even though we're doing some other projects there, this is the major one uh, going to the next. The, the next is just a series of roof projects. We have 21 buildings throughout our system that we have needed to replace the roofs for some time. And... Uh, have been uh, patching and duct taping and everything else those roofs to try to, to continue on of course if you don't repair the roof then other things happen to your building um, so we're being able to take advantage of this money to get all of those that were on our six-year plan hopefuls uh, taken care of and you know roof replacements and things like that aren't easy to get donations for so we're, we're really looking to use this money that way uh, the third one is at Jefferson it's it's one that's a little bit odd from the others. It's a 12-story uh, tower that houses all the science labs and uh, significant classrooms for our downtown campus. And we have done a study in hope to renovate this. In fact, that uh, the hope of renovating this building has been going on for about um, four or five biennium, and we, we never can quite get the funding together to do it. Um, the college has tried to put their resources to it. We're just not there. So we did a new study uh, trying to see what we would need. Um, our consultants, after almost a year-long study, have determined that this building has such significant issues, not only HVAC, plumbing, um, structural, uh, seismic, a whole lot of issues like that that are really almost nearly impossible to overcome. Uh, the other issue is that the science labs in here are all the size uh, for the 1960s environment, and of course science technology has much changed. And so the renovation of those labs, even if we were able to fully renovate them, would never provide us the laboratory space that's necessary for the modern uh, student. Um, and so after deliberation and, and careful analysis, because we really thought we needed to save this building, we are actually looking to build a new building across the street for the science labs and classrooms uh, with this asset preservation money because we, we just really have to get out of this building. Um, and then in, in the years to come, we will take this building down and build a classroom building that serves the other things there. But 
it, it's not, nor, you know, you don't normally think of asset preservation as tearing uh, an existing building down, but in this case, it's about 70% less expensive to do it this way than it would be to try to save a building that would, even if we saved it would not meet the needs that we actually have, so there would always be compromises. Um, so again, I, I just want to thank the General Assembly uh, for the asset pre preservation money. It is very important to us, and we're going to make use of every penny that we can. Um, as others have said, the uh, construction market is plagued right now with uh, uh, supply chain issues and with labor issues. Uh, and so we're seeing projects um, that are coming in, and it's, it's odd because this is such a wide range that you think, well, can't somebody estimate better than that? But you just can't to, until midday. We'll have projects come in 15% under our estimates and 30% over our estimates. And the estimates are being provided by people who normally are pretty close to right on the spot. So that's how much volatility is in the market. So part of that, what we're trying to do is we're looking at our projects and the timing and scheduling of all these projects that we're trying to accomplish, looking at the area that they're being accomplished in and trying to schedule these so that we hit the market at the right time. You know, if you, if you hit a market when there's a whole lot of construction underway, your prices go up. If you can hit it at a time when there's a little lag. So we're really looking closely at all of the different areas that we deal with, which are statewide, and trying to take advantage of that. We've been a little successful so far with projects that weren't asset preservation, and so we're looking to, as we move these through trying to do the same thing. Um, so our hope is uh, if we can keep management of the project so that our, our current budgets and estimates work, then we're going to accomplish all that. Uh, if not, we'll have some projects that we have to look at doing later. Um, my hope is that we do it well enough that we end up being able to go ahead and take care of some things that we'll come back to CPE and ask for permission to do uh, to better utilize this fund, these funds. We'll, we'll, at the end of the day, as I said before, we'll end up with about $310 million worth of projects that we still need to do after this, but um, that's where we are. So. Yeah. That was fast enough. Chair Southworth, Chair McCool, I do want to say this quickly in case CTCS is a good example of this. You know, y'all provided some money for new buildings, too, that were severely needed for the future of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to build this just-in-time, with a lack of a better phrasing, just-in-time need that much of our economic development's bringing to us. But we're also trying to design it for the future. So I know this is about asset preservation. We always appreciate, and CPE brought this as number one, but the idea that we do need new buildings. And we did look with this asset preservation money, if it would cost less to get rid of a building and build one for the future, then we were going with that as a cost savings, but yet thinking about what it meant for uh, our workforce and the needs that we have now. So I did want to throw that in in addition. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. I don't see any questions or comments, but so Dr. Thompson, I want to thank you and certainly all the presenters today. I know what we've done in the past hasn't fully taken care of everything, but at the same time, I think it's a good start, and we can, should continue on that. And and, some, and you're right, I've dealt with that. Sometimes it's actually cheaper to go ahead and tear a building down and build a new one than it is to renovate it because of all the restrictions in it. So thank you all for your time today. Do you, uh, do you have questions? Oh, and uh, we, we've got another presenter coming up in just a minute, Katie. Thank you so much, Dr. Thompson. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Mr. Ritter. Okay, would you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, and, uh, sir. Uh, che Ritter with the Kentucky Department of Education. Um, and with your permission, Chair, I'd like to invite Mr. Akers from the Kentucky Center for School Safety up please. to the table. Please. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Akers, time is very limited, and if it's okay with the chair, I'd like for him to uh, go over a few things with you all. Now, the last meeting, I was here virtually back, uh, way back in July, which is a lifetime ago in school facilities. As you know, we've had floods in eastern Kentucky, a special session, and a lot has changed even in that time. 
But one of the questions from this board uh, was some clarification on the Kentucky Center for School Safety, their role in the construction process. And Mr. Akers, I've invited him to help uh, clarify uh, some answers that we provided last time. So, I'm John Akers, the director of the Kentucky Center for School Safety, and uh, I'm on a national panel uh, in a few minutes here, and I talked to the chair there, and I said, give me about 20 minutes, and he said, hey, he'll give me 20 minutes so I don't have to rush through right, thank you. here, so I just want to set the record straight on that. Thank you. I, I know one concern I think that we all have is about school security and school safety. Uh, Representative Lewis's question earlier, I thought he was asking me. Uh, I woke up out of my daydream and thought I'd better answer this question. It's the same question we struggle with uh, in school facilities. How do you make a building secure mm -hmm. and safe for all students? Um, and I will say we have a beyond wonderful working relationship with the Kentucky Center for School Safety. Frequently, um, they will have questions for us. We will have questions for them. Uh, to, to say that we talk quite often with them is the understatement. We enjoy our relationship with them. We enjoy their input. Um, recently, we're revamping our 2008 planning manual. We're a few years behind. And part of that revamp is taking school security input from the Kentucky Center for School Safety and applying that into that planning manual. And I'll give you a life example, a real life example, or what they call aquariums, which in my old high school, the library was fully glass. That's not a great security thing in a high school. So uh, balconies and things like that. So as these designers and architects were looking at designing a school, they're considering, much like the gentleman from UK mentioned, how do we you know, build a safer environment going forward? Uh, you know, in 2008, many things were different then. And of course, when I was in high school back in 1991, many things are very different back then too. So I'd like Mr. Akers, if you could, just to kind of explain what they do at the Kentucky Center for School Safety. As yes, well. thank you very much. Go ahead. Oh, in a brief nutshell, um, we coordinate any of our efforts with the Department of Education and now with the Office of State School Security Marshal when it comes to any of these issues here. Uh, back after the uh, shooting that they had at um, Newtown, Connecticut, Senator Wilson was the chair of the Education Committee, and he came to me and said, what can we do? And I gave him some suggestions. One of them was look at putting SEPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, on the docket for consideration to see before schools build anything or before they get into any kind of renovation, look at some of these criteria on uh, keeping, uh, keeping the buildings secure and keeping the kids secure through crime prevention through environmental design. That was rolled into the law. And then we worked with our friends over here at the Department of Education and came up with about 25 different indicators that, uh, that uh, architects are to, to consider along with boards of education when uh, planning out any kind of new facilities. And so um, as far as our Centers for School Safety is concerned, that's what we do as far as the building portion of this thing is concerned. We have a, a whole array of other services that you, so some of you are very well aware of that I won't get into at this time, but we'll just focus in on the construction and the building security portion of this thing. Thank you. I think that was one of the questions we had was are the uh, safety and the construction, uh, whether it's renovation or new construction, are you working together? And I'm hearing that you are. Definitely. And it's very important because you don't want to do change orders after the process is taking place. <laughs> right. And you want to do that early on. So I, uh, what I'm hearing is great news. So thank you for doing that. And any, any other questions or comments for security? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it, John. So if, if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, there's also a question to further refine. Uh, if you recall, in the last meeting in July, uh, we spoke about uh, the cost of inflation uh, and construction projects, which my predecessors were also speaking on the same exact topic. Um, and we came, we wanted to get a list together of active projects for districts who had had what we called the multiple nickels. And if you recall, these were local tax levies, which were restricted to facilities funding and due to inflation, uh, they had maxed out their bonding potential. They couldn't really borrow much more, and they'd sort of hit that precipice of, you know, this project has exceeded our ability to pay. So we sent a survey out to about 122 districts um, and sort of kept refining it to get it, whittle it down to this smaller group of districts that met that criteria. Um, and in some cases, uh, we were getting feedback from districts. They, you know, got many projects planned or they've held back quite a bit. Uh, because of the cost of construction that was expected um, and much like sort of like our housing market there's i'm sure there are people who thought about building a new house and then they look at the cost and said we might want to wait um, and there some may be waiting to see if the prices start to go down on steel material labor etc 
Of course, we're still hearing the same information we heard back in July, which is the labor market's very tight. Uh, construction uh, companies are very, very busy. And of course, I'm sure if you call any school district in, in the state, they tell you the same thing, that the costs have really exceeded you know, what we would consider our normal expectations of um, just usual cost. And of course, with the floods in Eastern Kentucky, uh, this creates, again, another issue, which is you now have a higher demand in that area to get these students back in school, uh, which I think I read this morning that Perry County is sending some of their students over to another school building. Um, and to their credit, the districts are very nimble. Uh, they just didn't close up shop. They're still going to teach kids. They're doing what they can to get them in safe buildings. Uh, but the future uh, to rebuild is it, the labor market, again, is tight. The cost of materials is up. And they will deal with, you know, what UK mentioned and KCTCS is the cost have definitely gone up. So the list I provided the committee is basically a snapshot in time, uh, which was back probably in um, August or thereabouts. So if you redid this list in six months, the prices will probably change again. I would guess it will move just like the stock market. Uh, it will be fairly erratic. Thank you very much. I, I know when we first was talking about this, we wanted to get some kind of list uh, as construction, new new building, or, or even renovations, that the, had some criteria to it that they had to have the, the two nickels passed, uh, age of the building, mm -hmm. and um, and certainly in some cases where you've had an overpopulation for the building, so that maybe the old building was designed for 400 students mm -hmm. and now they're serving 900, certainly would be a qualifier to why you would need a new school. Um, but you're but I want to make sure that all these that are on this list here have done the 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 double nickel yes or more in some or cases. more yes yes or so more. every district has that facility support program of kentucky nickel uh, that's a mandatory by statute and then beyond that some of these will have what's called the recallable nickel uh, mm -hmm. mr hicks is sitting in front of me here he and i've had conversations about nickels for a few a few times during the budget process um, but uh, there's also some older nickels called growth nickels uh, these were back uh, yeah. probably mid 2000s or so. Those about everybody done that growth nickel. What I didn't, yeah, didn't about every school do the growth nickel. No, just a handful of those. The the, all, okay. all, the f facility support program of Kentucky nickel is the one that everybody has. Okay, so that I guess, counts as one. And okay. then you have, of course, the multiple nickels like the recallable. Uh, in the case of, uh, I'll just grab one out of here. Breathitt County has a recallable nickel as well on top of their mandatory facility support program of Kentucky nickel. So maybe you can help me out on this because mm -hmm. what I've got here is the original growth nickel, then I've got the equalized growth nickel, mm -hmm. and then I've got the recallable nickel. And, and of course in my mind, which I may be way off base here, the, the original one was just something that I thought basically all of them had, but then the two that I was looking at was the uh, equalized growth nickel and the recallable nickel, but that's not the one and two. Right. The original growth was the first growth nickel of two. Uh, so over time, the General Assembly wrote legislation in the mid-2000s that the original growth was a handful of districts. They came back uh, a session or two later and wrote another one, basically another growth nickel, a second growth nickel. Okay. Uh, the, the naming convention of these is very confusing. Yeah. Uh, I will admit to that. I was not involved in the naming convention. I will not take credit for that, but it is very confusing. <laughs> Mr. Atkins, you got a comment on that? All right, so, so I know who to blame now, uh, and, and I still laugh about the disagreement. Yeah, I, we have a friendly disagreement with John's office about if it's recallable or retroactive, so this has been an ongoing conversation for many years. Do we have any questions or comments from the... Uh... Are you ready for questions now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. From the committee. And, and I had, you know, you've answered mine because I had I pulled up an old website evidently and, and some of these are are not listed as having the nickels and and some of them are. So, but you, you're saying all that you provided us yes. have done the, is the recallable nickel the second nickel? It can be for some districts, and I'll, and I'll give you an example. Breathitt County has a facility support program on Kentucky Nickel, which is also known as FSPK. Um, and not terribly long ago, I'd say less than six years ago or so, they levied another nickel, which was the recallable. So that's two for Breathitt County. 
And some districts over time, and Oldham is a great example, they were one of the original growth districts. So they got some additional uh, tax levies for that growth. And then years later, they did another one because they were still growing in Oldham County. Um, and that at, that at the time, you could see the pattern, which was these are areas that were growing very, very fast, northern Kentucky, et cetera, uh, where you would expect growth. Uh, Bowling Green, Warren County today would be our growth districts in that sense. Okay, thank you. So do you think with this list that there will be some, and it's maybe difficult, if not impossible to do, but prioritize these so we can have so we can we can look at different methods of prioritizing based on you know the facility that they're replacing or renovating uh, there's a ranking system in something called it's a kentucky facilities inventory classification system uh, that the general assembly uh, helped us get started a couple of years back not all districts participate in that it's not mandatory but it is what it says it is it's an inventory system so these buildings are classified uh, and you'll have a, a ranking system in there um, we can also look at age building and, you know, some other conditions and see if that, you know, give different priorities so you can have some kind of view of that. Population growth. Population growth. You can have uh, capacity. Capacity. Uh, things like that, sure. Well, and, and maybe that's something we can look at in, in the future on this. And, uh, and what we ultimately want to do is I think we all want to come up to a place where we can help these schools continue on their efforts so they can get the buildings done and get students in, in, in the classrooms. Um, so we needed some kind of guideline that maybe we could uh, present to the rest of our legislative body and, and certainly the governor for consideration and gives them a, a, a roadmap or a pipeline or whatever you want to call it so that we can identify these. And, and if we can do half of them now, then maybe we can do the other half at a, another time. But they're all important. They're all, no doubt or they wouldn't be on here. But we're just trying to find a mechanism to help. And my concern was initially too was uh, that gap money that's needed because of the high cost of construction and materials and everything else. What we don't want to do is present money out there and then you're waiting five years from now to even start construction. So we're missing. So how do we, how do we fix that? And so we can prioritize, use some criteria like that and, and make this, you've already got like the, the double nickel on, applied to this. So make sure we use that as a base and then everything else uh, applies to that. Uh, certainly entertain questions, comments, and if I'm off base, let me know. That's okay. Thank you, Representative McCool. Um, I, I agree with everything Representative McCool says. We, we, we need to try to find a way to make these projects happen. Um, I guess one question I have, and I mean, it, it seems like some of the, I mean, obviously everything's gone up. I mean, we're dealing a period of rampant inflation. Um, but I mean, some of the costs here seem like that they've gone up even much faster than what we're seeing out of, you know, the reports out of Washington and everything. Would, would you have an explanation for that exactly? Uh, when we when we sent out the survey, in some cases, we feel like, you know, the architects usually provide, you know, there's different rounds of estimates. Um, you know, the first round is what we would call a little looser, you know, and that gets refined as the process goes on. And we accept that for what it is. It's an estimate. Um, I feel like in the survey we sent out, you know, we tried to get them to pin down a pretty firm number. But with respect to, you know, none of them can guess what it looks like tomorrow. A lot of these projects have not, you know, what we would say broken ground. They're in the either really far into the planning stages and stuff. So I don't really have a specific answer, you know, and, and I noticed the same thing, you know, in some districts. And, and we expected some of that. Your mileage may vary by district. Um, some of these projects... Uh, they removed quite a bit to get it under budget. You know, I know Menifee County, who's not on this list, um, but their central office, they'd remove the basement in order to fit this under their bonding potential. And that told me immediately that, you know, this is kind of the, the shape we're in right now is uh, districts having to make those decisions or local boards are. Um, so I think through further refinement and then once you get that list and say you want to prioritize it, we can keep going back and checking. Uh, repeatedly to say where's your estimate now you know is it lower higher you know where's that at to pin it down a little tighter um, typically uh, if we have a project anywhere you know that first estimate um, you know quite frankly I know they pay attention to it but we expect some pretty you know not wild swings but in a nor normal year you expect some differences in the refined estimate the construction companies will tell you this is what still is going to cost and they get that estimate further refined 
And eventually, once it takes off, they have a you know a pretty good estimate, you know, comfortable. What I would say a comfortable estimate, uh, although it may be higher or lower in some cases. It's you know they're pretty firm on it. And our construction companies and architects are very good at this. You know, obviously, I'm not a construction company or an architect and don't want to get into that business. But I think they do a really nice job of helping these districts understand, you know, to keep cost under control and to deliver these, you know, uh, facilities uh, either under budget or close to it. Okay, so, so I guess these numbers are, are, and I guess I'm just trying to now, to, do they, do you think they kind of estimate high initially in the hopes that, you know, to give themselves some, the, the, some they cushion? They may, you know, if I'm in their seat, I probably would consider that too. You know, when you're trying to get into that ballpark of, you know, you think eight, did you put eight and a half or nine? You know, I think that's probably fair. And again, we can go back to them multiple times. And, and they understand this, what we're trying to do here is to put our thumb on what this cost is really doing. And I think as time goes on, these projects, the estimates get tighter and tighter and tighter. So I think we can get, uh, but I, I agree with you. I think some of them probably looked at this and thought we need to, you know, factor in what it, what's over the horizon, basically. I think that may very well be the case in some of these. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, along with those things, you know, those categories we talked about having, you know, the double nickel, the, the overpopulation, you may even have a category there for, to write in justification of why this may be a higher priority. Just a brief, brief of something of that nature. Uh, again, I, I think we're all on the same page. We want to, uh, I appreciate what I appreciate what you provided to us, and certainly this helps us get moving on down the on down the road. I, I referred to it earlier as, as a funnel. We've got all this information, but we're trying to narrow it down to something that we can present and hopefully get additional funding for to fill these gaps. So these these uh, schools throughout this is statewide. This isn't any local anyone. It's it, this is across the state. So how do we how do we fill that gap so we can get these students taken care of with the at, as quickly as possible with the rising cost of construction and everything else that's beyond the local school and local communities control they can't so how do we fix that so um if, if that's okay when we'll work on this even if that's okay yes sir and i appreciate that any other comments or questions about this presentation You've done a really good job. Thank you, sir. No question. Or, they, or they'd be bombarding you right now, wouldn't they? So, um, so seeing no more questions, thank you so much. And I hope we'll have a conversation afterwards if yes, that's sir. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, the only other item we got on this uh, agenda is the uh, survey. Uh, we're going to hold that over to the uh, next meeting in October, uh, which will be scheduled for October the 11th at, at 1 p.m. And uh, uh, Senator Southworth will be chairing that one. We have a couple other presentations. So if you haven't done the survey, please do that. That helps. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for attending today. And thank you all for your presentations. We are adjourned. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. I'm glad we're all up here asking for money. That's right. Everybody's got millions and billions. Yeah. Hey, check out the